This video contains elements that are not suitable for children under the age of 14. Viewer discretion is advised. Generic song, generic song, some jackass wrote this in his sleep. 1992 was the year that the Vanilla Ice movie came out. From Universal Pictures, cool as ice. Okay, well, to be technical, it was at the end of 1991, but that was still within the Billboard chart year of 1992, so I'm gonna give the movie's cultural impact, what very, very little there was, to 92. I haven't seen this movie before, but judging by this film's trailer, it's pretty clear that I need to drop everything right now and go see it. This looks amazing. What the hell is that? Drop that zero and get with the hero. I cannot remember the last time that I've laughed so hard at a film trailer. I need to find a copy of this now. Their values are from the 50s. Their homes are from the 60s. And their music is from the 70s. Well, let's start chasing. Actually, yeah, never mind. Screw you too, Ice. Needless to say, this movie was a bomb, because even just a year and a half after his breakthrough, Vanilla Ice had already rightfully been recognized for the walking punchline he was always meant to be. The Chronic was just around the corner, and even the gap between Ice and Dre was filled with the likes of Criss Cross on the poppier side and Arrested Development on the realer side. So by 92, nobody had any use for Vanilla Ice, besides the character designer for Johnny Bravo, I guess. However, that didn't stop him from releasing a promotional single from the movie, an epic statement of purpose that Mr. Robert Matthew Van Winkle was, indeed, cool as ice. So cool, in fact, that not only did the song fail to climb any higher than number 81, but it was nominated for a Razzie Award for Worst Original Song. And it lost. To this. You're losing your head. I mean, I'm losing my head. Oh! Would you guys be cool if I just let this play? Now I was cool, cool, and you know, just kicking it around the house. Oh, what well, a knock, a knock, a knock, and a voice, yo, can have him come out? Okay, okay, Bob. I'll start analyzing now. So, okay, first of all, I suppose it's good to know that our collective slavery to consumerism isn't a new thing. Commercial songs have been charting for decades now. But, uh, pardon me if I'm wrong, but isn't the idea of a promotional single to be enjoyed outside the context of the song, rather than just screaming the name of the movie at you over and over again? Then again, I suppose this was the decade that Space Jam, a feature-length shoe commercial, was released to theaters, so if there was ever an era for a rap theme song to an Addams Family movie to become a top 10 hit, I suppose it would be this one. I can imagine that the marketing team probably thought that a movie about the world's most famous family of sadomasochists wouldn't appeal to the family market, and so they said... Let me put this in a language you kids will understand. Hippity rap! And of course, it only could have come from the man, the myth, the legend, the hammer. You can't touch this. One thing that I found looking back at the early 90s was that, despite being such a massive presence in popular culture, MC Hammer's chart success on the general charts really didn't reflect that. Don't get me wrong, he was still pretty successful on the charts, with several top 10 hits to his name, but for what a media phenomenon the guy was, he left a relatively small impact on the year-end lists of the early 90s, which kind of surprised me. What surprised me even more was that this song, Adam's Groove, actually managed to peak higher than You Can't Touch This, the definitive MC Hammer song. Then again, if there was ever a guy who deserved to have his most famous song outperformed by a commercial jingle, it was probably MC Hammer. Oh. MC Hammer, where you been? Can't touch this. Lay's, America's favorite potato chip. You're not supposed to touch this. You may have noticed that I've hardly mentioned anything at all about the actual song so far, but really, do I have to? I mean, fine. I'll admit, in a lot of ways, this is better than some of the stuff on the first half of this list. It's got a mildly catchy groove, and there's really nothing annoying about it besides it going on for way too long. 
Lyrically, it tells the story of Hammer's experiences living next to the Adams family, and all the zany scenarios derived from this arrangement. I do admit that some of Hammer's ad-libs on this song actually managed to make me laugh harder than the Cooler Than Ice trailer. I remember the day I needed to ball a little bit of pepper. But honestly, even if this song had world-class production with a flow that would make Busta Rhymes nod his head in respect, which it doesn't, by the way, that still doesn't change the fact that the song that you're bopping your head to is called The Adam's Groove. Speaking and thinking about the Adam's, you know the hammer is with it. I don't outright hate this song as much as some of the other stuff from this year, like Jump Around or Brian Adams or even some of the stuff that missed this list, but I can't think of any song on this list that there is less of a reason to return to than this one. Honestly, I think the Razzie's got this one right. This song is indeed more useless than the Vanilla Ice movie theme song. I think that's all there is to say about that. Speaking and thinking about the Adams family. They don't hurt anyone. They just like to have fun. Generic song, generic song. Some jackass wrote this in his sleep. I feel like a lot of people today don't realize just how absolutely massive Boys to Men were in the 90s. I mean, people remember their name today, sure, but what most people don't remember is that between 1991 and 1997, Boys to Men went on an uninterrupted string of chart dominance that makes Drake's current monopoly on the charts look cute by comparison. The biggest song of 1992 was End of the Road, which spent a then record 13 weeks at number one, and yet that's still only the third longest running number one in Boys to Men's discography. Yeah, they were that successful. So here's a question for you. What would happen if you took Boys to Men, replaced their soothing baritones with a leaking balloon, replaced their instrumentals with a dollar store Casio that got wine spilled on it, and made them just... just... Just the whitest. You know, this group literally has the word bad in the title. I really shouldn't be so surprised that they turned out to suck this hard. Same thing with House of Pain, by the way. With a name like that, you have to wonder if there was some degree of self-awareness. And speaking of self-awareness, yeah, I know that Color Me Bad isn't actually all white, but you know what? UB40 wasn't all white either, and that doesn't change the fact that they're one of the whitest bands in history. As a matter of fact, All For Love sounds exactly like what would happen if UB40 tried to be boys to men. You see, Boys and Men's whole gimmick was that they started out as an acapella group, which led them to develop the trade of solos with backup vocals on the verses, and almost entirely synchronized harmonies on the chorus, which was a novel concept at the time. I can't accuse Color Me Bad of ripping off Boys to Men, since they started at almost the exact same time, if not a little sooner than Boys to Men, but it is quite the coincidence that Color Me Bad also started out as a college acapella group, and they followed almost the exact same pattern, with solos on the verses and harmonizations on the chorus. They even both have one member delivering a verse entirely in spoken word. I'm here for you. All those times at night when you just heard me and just ran out with that other fella. Baby, I knew about it. Yo, come here, sweetheart. I want you to know something, all right? See, every day in my life without you would be like a hundred years. However, you may have noticed one slight difference. That being that boys to men's vocals are as rich and smooth as butter, whereas all four members of Color Me Bad have voices so whiny, irritating, and nasal that they make Justin Timberlake sound like Nate Dogg. However, even the vocals are really just a secondary reason why I can't stand this. The primary reason being just how weak, cheap, and chintzy the instrumentals sound. The first time I heard this, I thought that the instrumental sounded so tinny and compressed because of how old the video was, but then I looked up the official audio and it sounds exactly the same. Apparently the beat is a reworked sample of an old 60s R&B song. I listened to the original and while it definitely isn't aged recording, it still somehow sounds better than the song that sampled it nearly 30 years later. That is inexcusable. 
As abrasive as Brian Adams was, at least his production team understood how to mix audio properly. This song just sounds like a production from amateurs, and the fact that this was a number one hit absolutely baffles me. Still, I debated with myself as to whether or not this song deserved to be so low on this list. Then I looked up the lyrics. Now, to be clear, the spoken lyrics themselves aren't the issue. The song falls into the ever-growing category of songs from 1992 with not one single lyric that isn't a cliché, and I've already complained about that enough. No, I'm talking about the written lyrics. What do I mean by that? Well, let me just play you the first verse with the official subtitles provided to Lyrics Genius by Color Me Bad and see if you can spot what I take issue with. Generic song, generic song, some jackass wrote this in his sleep. Donnie D's on the back up, truck free, so put the crack up. No need for speed, I'm anti, D-I-U-G-G-I-E, my, come on, feel the vibration. Yeah. Mark Wahlberg is not a one-hit wonder. I cannot tell you how long I've been waiting to share this. This is how it is on the wild side. Okay. So, you remember back in 2010 where someone thought it would be a good idea to remake We Are the World 25 years after the fact, and it turned out to be a ridiculous, overbloated, preachy disaster? Well, imagine that, except it's trying to remake an all-time classic with a Scruff McGruff cartoon tossed in, and you've got a recipe for Wild Side, a song where you learn about the evils of drugs, racism, and gang violence from Marky Mark, Ashy Ace, Scotty G, DJ T, and Hector the Booty Inspector. I could not make this up if I tried. She says, hey babe, take a walk on the wild side. For those of you who don't know, this song uses the beat from, and is a spiritual successor to, a song called Walk on the Wild Side by Lou Reed. This song was a minor hit back in 1972, and it became famous for being one of the first major radio hits to talk directly about harsh real-world topics like prostitution, drugs, oral sex, and transgenderism. It's listed on Rolling Stone's Greatest Songs of All Time, which I imagine is likely mostly because of its influence, because as far as I'm concerned, this song really hasn't held up all that well. The beat may be an all-time classic, but it has the same problem as Runaway Love, where it just kind of brings up really challenging issues, but then doesn't really address them beyond saying they exist. So, who better to go into more depth about these topics than the guy whose biggest hit is remembered because of somebody else's hook and his older brother's production. Wildside tells a series of short character vignettes, each pertaining to a harsh aspect of street life. Seems like a perfectly reasonable idea. But there's just one itty bitty teensy weensy little problem. It's being told by Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. Mark Wahlberg is way out of his depth here. At least when Ludacris talked about child abuse, he gave as many details as he could get away with, and he had the flow and cadence that made it properly sympathetic and somber. Mark just isn't a strong enough rapper to handle something this heavy. Rather than sounding passionate or emotionally invested in this story, he just sounds like he's trying to calculate how to fit the words into his flow. It's so awkward. Cause nine to five wasn't worth the headaches, so Ron figured out a faster way to make money. During the first two verses, it's nothing but just clunky and awkward. I mean, hell, in the second verse, he doesn't even explain why the guy got killed, so that was a total waste of time. But then we get to the last two verses. And a hail of bullets zip through the crowd. One hit Tiffany and instantly she died. For now, I'll give Wahlberg the benefit of the doubt and assume that he got permission from the parents of the little girl named Tiffany, who actually died in the turf war in Boston in 1988, for her death to be immortalized forever in this top 10 hit for a guy who had nothing to do with it. But then we get to the other real world crime that Wahlberg referenced in this song the story of Charles Stewart. 
Charles Stewart murdered his pregnant wife in cold blood and claimed she had been killed by a black man. For those of you who don't know what happened, Stewart shot and killed his wife and unborn child for the insurance money before wounding himself with a gun and blaming the attack on an unidentified black man, which resulted in a manhunt in Boston where many innocent black men were illegally prosecuted and detained before the truth came out. So how does Mark choose to portray this harrowing, horrifying story of deceit and systematic injustice? Charles and his brother came up with a plan. Kill Carol, collect the big checks, blame it on a black man. What the heck? <laughs> blame it on a black man. What the heck? In a year that contained Baby Got Back, I'm Too Sexy, and The Adam's Groove, that is always going to be the funniest moment in Bob 1992 to me. What the heck? However, while the song does have its moments of genuine hilarity like that one, this is still one of the few songs that legitimately makes me cringe almost all the way through, because of how it takes some very serious issues and presents them in such an awkward, stilted, and oversimplified way. However, despite all of that, I still kind of struggled uh, for putting this song on this list because, I mean, at least the intentions were good, right? It seems like Mark Wahlberg legitimately wanted to spread awareness and combat racism, so surely he deserves some credit for that, right? If you'll excuse me, uh, please allow me to take a moment to just quickly read out for you some of the things that Mark Wahlberg has said and done during his lifetime. <coughs> he has a history of yelling racial slurs at Vietnamese people. He once beat a Vietnamese man unconscious with a large wooden stick while calling him ethnic slurs, and later that same day beat a second Vietnamese man, a veteran, so badly that he was permanently blinded. He also once beat his neighbor so badly that his jaw was fractured, and last but not least, he shouted racial slurs and threw rocks at black children, including a group of school children on a field trip. And then, as these events are still going on, this guy releases a top 10 hit where he talks about one of the most famous cases of racial injustice of the late 80s, and he responds to it with a flippant, What the heck? So you know what? Yeah, I think this song deserves to be in this place. Generic song, generic song, some jackass wrote this in his sleep. You know what tends to produce awesome music? Sports movies. Yeah, you know the tracks I'm talking about. The big pump-up anthems that are intended to get you really hyped up for some awesome, gritty, ball-to-the-wall athleticism. Kick ass. Yeah, every sports movie needs that one breakthrough centerpiece smash single to really hold the whole thing together and to help define the movie as a piece of popular culture. What's surprising to me is how many of these songs come from no-name artists. I mean, you think these movie studios would recruit the biggest superstars in the world to put together the promotional song for these movies. And wouldn't you know, it just so happens that, in 1992, when Columbia Pictures released a hilarious Tom Hanks comedy about the world's first women's professional baseball league from back in the 40s, they got the biggest superstar in the world, who also appeared in the movie to contribute a song to the soundtrack. And like clockwork, it was a number one hit this year. Alrighty then, the theme song for the world's first professional women's baseball team, blazing new trails and smashing preconceptions about who can be a superstar, sounds awesome. Hit it. Well, yeah, right. It's a Madonna movie. Something had to suck. Okay, I'm sorry that I misled you guys. This song obviously isn't a training montage soundtrack like Eye of the Tiger or anything like that. It's the song that's played over the ending credits of the film. And oh boy does that make sense because this is the perfect song to play over the end credits to a wacky screwball comedy to let everybody know that the fun is over and it's time to get the hell out of the theater. 
It blows my mind that Madonna chose this song to turn in for the soundtrack to a league of their own. And it blows my mind even more that this song reached number one on the charts, because I can't imagine why anybody would ever want to listen to this horribly unpleasant dirge. I like to think that I'm relatively well-versed when it comes to popular music, but I will admit that Madonna is kind of a blind spot for me. Considering that she's easily within the top five most influential musical artists of the past century, I know quite a bit about Madonna, but I haven't listened to even a quarter of her songs. However, even a clueless idiot like me knows that this... this isn't Madonna. This song is so tired, draining, and lifeless that, if it weren't for the distinctive early 90s keyboard in the beginning, I legitimately wouldn't be surprised if this was a 2016 track. And why do they always say, Don't look back? The verses and chorus are designed to naturally flow seamlessly into one another without changing tone, which was apparently a point of critical praise at the time, but as far as I'm concerned, it just means that the entire song slogs through its excruciating five-minute runtime with no peaks, valleys, or other variations of any sort. I know that I've already gone on for way, way too long about the lyrics of songs this year being overly bland and simple, but this is Madonna, the queen of pop, one of the most brilliant and successful musicians of all time. I don't think it's too much to ask for her to write verses that are better than Don't look back, keep your head held high, don't ask them why, because life is short, and before you know, you're feeling old, and your heart is breaking, don't hold on to the past, well that's too much to ask, oh my god, how are you so bad at this, that doesn't even rhyme! I don't like this song very much, is the general gist of what I'm trying to say here. I chose to make a list about 1992 because I wanted a change of pace from how utterly monotonous, droning, and uninteresting the pop scene of today is, and this song has taken even that from me. This song is the polar opposite of what I want from a sports movie song, a Madonna song, and a number one hit. And there is no song on this list that I want to hear again less than this one. Now you'd think that means that this song deserves the number one spot, right? After all, if this is a song that I least want to ever hear again, well, isn't that what this list is talking about? Well, we'll talk about what managed to beat this song in a second, right after the dishonorable mentions. Wishing you were here with me. Generic song, generic song, some jackass wrote this in his sleep. You know that something's gone horribly wrong when someone is forced to say the words the Rascal Flats version was better out loud. Also, I totally knew that this singer was Canadian before I even looked it up. Make it that what you will. Don't tell my heart, my aching, breaking heart. Bro Country may take the cake for the single stupidest point in country music history, but this is a pretty close second. Also, this song is indirectly responsible for, uh... Yeah, all of this, so, um... Yeah. This song barely missed the year-end top 10, and it sounds like a Sesame Street song. It's kind of charming in its innocence at first, but trust me, it grates on repeated listen. This song's entire first half is so boring that it's even worse than this used to be my playground. It would be on this list except for the fact that, at exactly the halfway point, the song suddenly snaps and goes absolutely off the rails insane, which is at least interesting enough to keep it off. Also, the alien girl looks suspiciously like Michael Jackson, and I don't like it. If I were to make a top 10 list of the 10 things that I least ever want to hear boys to men singing about, moaning and groaning with pleasure in my ear would probably be on top of that list. Also, this song has the single most unnerving intro to any song that I have ever heard. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Injection, fellas. Mom! I 
really like the lyrics and the conceit behind this one. By God, you have no idea how refreshing that is to say about this year. But I have never enjoyed En Vogue. They're already trying to sing in full force, so add overseeing on top of that and it just sounds wretched. And at least they can harmonize pretty well. The production here is pretty flimsy, even by 90s Eurodance standards, and the lyrics make I'm a Bee sound like a Kendrick Lamar song by comparison. Take a shot each time they say please don't go in this song, and by the halfway point you'll have more alcohol in your body than water. Apparently this is a cover of an old Casey and the Sunshine Band song, which kind of surprises me. Honestly, if you wanted to cover them, why didn't you just cover That's the Way I Like It like every other one-hit wonder? I'm too sexy for my shirt. Shirts so sexy it hurts. And I am too sexy for the land. It's not that funny, guys. And I am too sexy for this song. It's the final countdown. The final countdown. Honestly, kind of surprised by my own number one pick. Because this isn't the type of song that you usually think of when you think worst song of the year. Let's take a quick look back at my worst songs of other years. In 2017, I thought the worst song of the year was Insulting and Harmful. In 2016, I thought the worst song was Lazy and Pretentious. And in 2007, I thought the worst song was Irritating and Cloying. None of these adjectives describe my number one pick for this year. The song that I picked is a perfectly serviceable piece of music. There's really not much wrong with it, and it's actually even a little bit pleasant. But when I look back at the music of 1992, the main thing that stuck out to me about this year on whole was how gutless and samey it was. With very few exceptions, the music of 1992 wasn't bad, but that's only because it tried nothing new and took no risks. Every musical trend was boiled down to its dullest, simplest and most basic form, to the point where it was extremely difficult to find anything at all worth talking about. My number one pick on this list is representative of this mindset of music, of taking the safest and easiest route to appeal to as many people as possible, resulting in an empty, passionless, and useless product which is destined to be lost to the ages of mediocrity. The only difference between this song and about two-thirds of the rest of the year was that it took this mindset of creating edgeless products and applied it to an existing song that was already as close to perfect as you can get. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, I'll stop drawing this out. Without further ado, a tale as old as time. At this point, we're all kind of used to the phenomenon of the Disney song. And we're all used to Disney releasing a cover of that song by one of the artists they keep chained up in their basement, and then proceeding to immediately forget about it. However, in 1992, the concept of the Disney song was a new thing, as Beauty and the Beast was only the second musical that Disney had released in years, unless you count Oliver and Company, which you shouldn't. To help advertise the movie, Disney commissioned then one-hit wonder Celine Dion to team up with professional duet machine Peebo Bryson to create an adult contemporary cover of the centerpiece of the first animated movie ever to be nominated for Best Picture. Now, before I explain why this boring little duet is my least favorite song of 1992, let's take a quick minute to look at the original. Tale as old as time as it can be. Beyond its placement in the context of the movie and the animation that accompanies it being damn near perfect, the song's a beautiful ode to friendship turning into love, with wonderfully elegant yet simple lyrics that capture the full spectrum of emotion of falling for someone. 
And what makes it so utterly wonderful is Angela Lansbury's performance. Ever just the same Ever a surprise Apparently she originally wanted someone else to sing this song, because she thought that she was too old and her voice wasn't strong enough to perform it properly. However, not only is her voice absolutely beautiful on this song, but the age in her voice lends a sense of world wariness that can't be overstated. It makes the song sound almost ethereal, like words of wisdom that's been passed down for generations. Beauty and the Beast truly is one of the greatest musical numbers ever put to film. And then we have the Celine Dion version. Like I mentioned at the beginning, this duet doesn't sound bad. Both Dion and Bryson give technically proficient performances, if a bit oversung, and the production is equally adequate. However, ask yourself this. How is this song different from any other easy listening duet on the radio? Well, as someone who has now listened to every single song from this musical shovelware bin of a year, my answer to you is nothing. Nothing at all. Both of these singers have plenty of bland competence, but none of the personality or charm that helped Landberry's version absolutely steal the show. Just compare the two side by side and you'll see what I mean. Both a little scared, neither one prepared, beauty and the beast. Both a little scared, neither one prepared, beauty and the beast. And then, of course, there was the decision to make this song a duet. Now, when you make a song a duet, it's supposed to be for a damn good reason, because it completely changes the structure of a song by introducing the expectation of some sort of interplay or chemistry between the two singers. You need to make sure the two singers complement each other, and they're able to play to each other's strengths and complement each other's weaknesses. So, how did Disney go about the monumental task of deciding which two singers would cover their most critically acclaimed song in decades? Well, they picked Dion because she was a cheap up-and-comer desperate for a second hit. They didn't think Dion would be marketable enough because she was so new, so they decided to make the duet and added Bryson because he was also cheap. And trust me, it sounds that way. The two singers spent a good portion of this song harmonizing, and as you listen to this, ask yourself, do you feel any passion, tenderness, or love between these two people? Or do you just hear two singers singing a Disney song for a paycheck? And by this point, you're probably saying to yourself, oh, come on, Sean. I mean, sure, this is a corporate sellout track by Disney. Shocking, I know. But why does it deserve to be at number one? Well, to that I say, it deserves to be at number one not only because it's a corporate sellout track, but because the sound of this corporate sellout track was almost indistinguishable from about two-thirds of this entire hundred-song list. Beauty and the Beast may not be the most unlistenable song of 1992, but it is the song that best represents everything that was wrong with the music of 1992. 1992 isn't the worst year of music I've talked about so far, but it is the year that I have the least interest in returning to ever again. And this song is the poster child for why that is, on top of ruining one of the greatest songs that Disney has ever made. Beauty and the Beast by Celine Dion and Peebo Bryson. The worst hit song of 1992. Uh -oh. This town's gone wild since I married Adam They think I'm going straight to hell She'll burn bottom in hell But the charge is laid on me A bestiality Could wind up getting me thrown in a cell She is a Oh, I'm overrun by madness They plan to burn Help the man!
He's yelling, you're right there, you can't help him. My God, what kind of mother are you? Mom!